free will is, is God giving us opportunities to meet and respond to other people, but we still have to make the decision of whether or not we're going to do that. So yes. God is not just managing us like puppets on a string, or God is not just throwing us out there and saying, you're on your own for the rest of your life. Yeah, right. God is saying, I will give you opportunities, but I will not choose for you. You must make your own choice. Good day and welcome back to another edition of the Faith in Real Life podcast. My name is Greg Wasinski and I'm so blessed that you are here with us and just loving that you're taking the opportunity to not only maybe grow in your faith, but to learn more about the life that we live out in the world and what are the values that we keep and what are some of the ways that we continue to have hope even when things seem to be falling down around us. And a lot of that has to deal with how we handle life and the different generations in which we're born uh, into, whether it's surroundings or whether it's culture, even uh, financial status can play into all of those things. And each one of us grows into a different person at different ages. So our relationship with God becomes more important than ever. And the way that we hold our faith close to us can really control the way that we handle the things that life throws at us. And so today my guest is Bill Miller, and Bill has been uh, not only an amazing disciple just in the way that he lives his life, but actually has spent time uh, journeying for the church and creating other disciples. So Bill, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Greg. It's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Now, Bill, how many years, you, you're blessed to be semi-retired, we'll, right. we'll just call that, uh, how many years did you spend in service of the church? Um, going back to my time in the military, I was in the Air Force for four years. That's where I began that service as a chaplain's assistant, and at that time, I was uh, about 22 years wow. old, and... So if you want to know how old I am now, let's just say uh, I've been doing it for more than 50 years. Man, you like uh, podcasts were not a thing back then, but they, they used to call it radio. And That's that was right. the same thing. That's right. That's right. Yes. Absolutely. So um, so you, you were in the military. Yes, I was in the Air Force right out of college. I was, uh, I went to the service because uh, it was during the Vietnam conflict, if you will. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, I had a low lottery number, so I was going to be drafted. And I decided mm. that I wanted a little more say in what I would do in the military. So I enlisted in the Air Force and got to choose a career field, which was... Um, let's just say calmer and uh, I was yeah. in personnel and that okay. was good and, and I actually became uh, a chaplain's assistant oh, and wow. so that's how my service to the church started and in the air force is there as in all the military branches uh it was and still is very ecumenical. So mm. we had Catholic chaplains, we had Protestant chaplains. I worked for both. Uh, I learned a lot about a lot of different denominations, mm -hmm. and I was basically primarily kind of a secretary. Right. But I just had a wonderful experience there, much much better than I could have ever anticipated. Yeah, and, and certainly God had a plan for you, and God was utilizing you in a way that you didn't expect, and then. Uh, it led into your life of ministry uh, for the church. That's correct. Right? That's correct. Now, yes. was that directly after the military? Did you? Um, interestingly, uh, I got even more involved in church work, probably you would say, after that. I joined a group called the Covenant Players, which was a okay. Christian theater ministry yeah. that was organized and run out of Los Angeles, okay, the yeah. big media town, so to speak. And it had been founded by a Presbyterian elder by the name of Chuck Tanner. And I, uh, I saw the Air Force, again, being very, they were, they were very uh, creative in how, in kinds of things they did with spirituality. So they invited a group of the Covenant players to both of the different bases where I was assigned in the military. And I was so impressed with what these people were doing uh, that I decided that 
I might like to try it myself. And yeah. I did join Covenant Players. I spent two and a half years there. And it became a very formative period in my life because that's where I met the woman I would eventually marry. And uh, she's taught me a lot about faith and God and relationships too. So that yeah. is, that, It's beautiful. And for people who might not know what the Covenant Players were or are mm-hmm. are they are still around? Covenant They're Place? still around. They're not as active. Their real heyday was actually back in the time when I was a part of them. They had uh, several uh, two between two and three hundred people who were ministering. Most of them ministered in North America, either right. the United States or Canada. We had. They also had missions in uh, South Africa, Australia, and they had an, a European mission that spoke German. Uh, mm-hmm. And they did. A, they also did a lot of work with the military, but they didn't work just for the military. They right. worked for churches and things. Uh, and they're not as big now. Uh, I think uh, part of the draw for the Covenant players back in the day was uh, young people were really kind of uh, exploring new things. You know, it was the 60s and 70s, and it yeah. was that time when people were uh, t- wanting to try new things. And those who were interested in faith development and were interested in theater just saw those two things working together with Covenant Players. Yeah, my good friend Carrie Ford uh, spent a number of years as an international missionary for Covenant Players and spent time in Italy and uh, oh, wow. Germany and Africa. Her time in Africa was is by far some of the best stories she's ever told. Oh, and uh, yes. she was a young uh, girl in her, her early 20s and yep. just being part of that. And these were people that, you know, they were going and living with host families and exactly. doing their productions and exactly. inviting people to the gospel in different ways. And the and stories it, are crazy when you hear some of them. Oh, it is. And, you know, it, it was, we did contemporary drama so it wasn't what some would call bathrobe drama where you had to dress up like saint peter would have looked yeah, in right. somebody's imagination or whatever but we did you know like we would set our scenes in places like shopping malls or the, the you know the family dinner table yeah and we would do the the shows usually in the sanctuary or the fellowship hall mm-hmm. and people had to use their imaginations which was really good too because right. people loved kind of using their imaginations to create these sets but then we used contemporary themes like justice or peace or harmony or patience or something related to faith or hope you know the yeah right the, the you know the virtues so, yeah yeah it was great stuff so you bring up an interesting point like um obviously you've been around the church for a while and uh as a lifelong catholic mm-hmm. you've seen the church change and grow and go from a, a place where Church was done in Latin, masses were done in Latin, (laughs) Uh, people didn't always know what was happening, to this era of where now theater became an expression for you, you know, as a way of honoring Christ and a way of introducing people to Christ. When you see the church now, and you've seen how much it's changed and grown, Mm -hmm. I know many people think that the church is shrinking and less people are going. Those are facts. I mean, the, the mm-hmm. church and right. the amount of people going post-2020 and, and mm-hmm. things has gone down. But when you think about the hope and you think about the opportunity that the church has now in the way that um, our church is reaching out and there's more Bible studies and there's more mm-hmm. opportunities for evangelization and things like that, what is your real hope that you see in the church for it to continue to engage people and bring them to Christ? Well, I think one of the most uh, hopeful things that I have seen, uh, both in the Catholic Church, where I am rooted, but also in other denominations, is uh, the the concept of God's unconditional love for us. Yeah. And for example, uh, my wife and I are pretty big fans of contemporary Christian music. Mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. I mean, I like, I like many of the hymns. I, I'm a cantor in my Catholic parish, so I sing a lot of Catholic hymns. Yeah. But I like listening to some what you might call more eclectic kinds of things. Uh, some of the contemporary artists like Francesca Battistelli or Mercy Me or uh, those, you know, uh, Michael W. Smith. People you like used that. a lot of those references in your first book. I do. Yeah. Exactly. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but sure. I, I noticed that you used a lot of those contemporary artists. Absolutely. They've meant a lot to me. And part of what they mean is it's the essence of 
helping people understand that life is about relationships. Mm -hmm. And the most important relationship is our relationship with the Lord, our relationship with God. However, we don't come to the fullness of that relationship in this world. You know, we, we go on, we live in this world because it's gift and it's important, but also looking towards the next life, life yeah. with God. And God teaches us that relationship is about what's important, not, you know, it's important the way we relate to God, but we relate to God through our relationships with each other mm-hmm. and also through having a uh, a good individual relationship with God. So, yeah. you know, that's why the the Catholic Church, for example, says when you pray, make sure you pray not just one-to-one with God, which is important, or sure. listening, but also with other people, because the whole thing about God is unconditional love is God's gift to us, God's primary gift to us. All of the rest of these gifts that God gives to us are expressions of God's unconditional love for us. And then yeah. what God is asking of us is merely come and be with me. Mm-hmm. Come mm-hmm. and use the gifts that I give you, whether it's gifts you see around you or whether it's your own gifts and talents. Use those gifts to develop your relationships helping other people, working with other people. And as you do that, you're sharing my love that I've gifted to you and you're sharing it with other people. And also that's that it, it multiplies. It's like it manifests itself also in the way that you show your love to me. Well, and and I think part of the reason that that has become, uh, so, widely uh, accepted or, or as part of, let's say, the movement, if you will, is that the way for the church to grow is to stop compartmentalizing Jesus, right? Mm-hmm. And so for many years, people felt that their worship that they did on a Sunday, going to Mass if you were Catholic, going to worship as a Protestant, like that was where you were a Christian. Right. And mm-hmm. we look at the aspects of Billy Graham, we look at the great evangelizers of the day, and we look at people that were talking about living this message of Christ Monday through Saturday, yep. which really ignited people. And then you talk about the music. Yeah. There's a really cool documentary called The Jesus Music. Mm. I don't know if you've seen this. I haven't seen it. I've heard of it. I mm-hmm. think you would like it because they go back to the original artist that came out of the Hate ashbury movement and what happened there, and how Christian music got its roots, and how much pushback it really got, because that was for the hippies, man. That was for peace and love. But these were people that were taking these peace and love experiences with drugs, and they were saying, we don't need the drugs. We can get this same euphoric feeling by giving our lives to Christ. Yes, that's right. And so uh, in this documentary, they interview Amy Grant, they interview Matt Marr, they interview Mercy Me, they talk Mm -hmm. to a lot of these contemporary worship artists and they talk about what this music meant and what this whole movement was birthed out of. Yes. And that was an inclusive love of Christ. Yes. That if you felt unworthy, if you felt unlovable, you didn't have to look to alternate substances, that there was a God who loved you. Yes. And, you know, that word inclusive is so important yeah. because that's what a lot of people were missing on when they were trying to segregate or segment your spirituality or your spiritual and religious lifetime from the rest of your life. Sure. It's all part of, I I do some spiritual direction. I'm a trained spiritual director. And one of the things I'm always working with people on is to see that your spirituality enhances and empowers and engages every other person part of your life, sure. I mean, or it should. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a part of the very essence of who you are. It, it is your identity, right? It, exactly. It, it truly is, whether we want to try to deny that or not, uh, made by God for God, yeah. as the church teaches. And I think, um, and I know this, and part of what we want to talk today is I want to talk about your new book and the impact that it's having on the retired community and, and those in the aging community and the senior community. Um, because there's been a lot of change in the church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that we talk about the excitement and the hope and the inclusivity, but there are many people that struggle with the church Mm -hmm. being different than it was when they grew up. And sometimes we don't always do the best job of explaining to them how we want them to grow too. We immediately move past, uh, and this is Greg talking, but we immediately move past 
uh, talking about the fears of our senior generation because they've been around so long, and we immediately turn to the youth, Mm -hmm. and we talk about how we have to bring the young people back. And there's a whole group of people sitting here that almost want to scream, at least in my eyes, what about me? Yeah. What about my fears? What about what I, I'm feeling? Like, I was I was coming here, and if I was Catholic, I was praying my rosary, or if I was Presbyterian, I was listening to music beforehand and reading scripture, mm-hmm. and this is what I did. And, and now you want to tell me that there's this praise and worship, and people talk when they come into the mm-hmm. sacred space, yeah, and right. I don't understand anything that's going on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so we, we have this conundrum, right, a, l- a little bit of the sure. beauty of hope as the church has grown mm-hmm. and people have begun to openly express their faith a little bit more yeah. inclusive versus the people who were taught and were molded that we have ultimate reverence mm-hmm. in a holy space mm-hmm. and uh, we do what the pastor says. How do we help people begin to transition? And I think you already mentioned a little bit about the unconditional love, but what advice can we begin to give those who maybe feel a little bit left behind uh, in the Catholic Church? I want to talk specifically about the Catholic Church, because that's what you and I know best, right? Sure, sure. Um, Mm -hmm. But post-Vatican II, which was in the 1960s, when the Church uh, really began this Mass in English and many of the translation changes and the the people people taking back the church as the body of Christ, as one might say. Mm-hmm. How do we begin to help people that uh, don't understand the church or or maybe can relate to some of the changes? Well, you just mentioned something that I think is a profound piece of all of this, Greg, and that is Vatican II, the Second Vatican Council. Um, I was blessed to grow up during the time and and become a young adult during the time which was, excuse me, at the time which was the bridge, it was the bridge between pre-Vatican II and post-Vatican II. In other words, I grew up during the Second Vatican Council, but the Second Vatican Council didn't really catch on in terms of being implemented until Uh, about the time that I was ready to move from the covenant players into a more specifically Catholic ministry. Uh, And I got my graduate degree in religious education from a Catholic college so that I could do religious education, catechetics, as we call it these days. And what, what was happening through the Second Vatican Council, the essence of the council part of the essence of it. Of course, it was all about God, but it was about let's make sure that lay people understand that they, we, by the virtue of our baptism, are part of the church. And so, for example, there was also an emphasis on the fact that the church was not the building. The building simply housed the church. The church was the people. Mm. And of course, the church was a place that also housed the Blessed Sacrament. So I'm not trying to diminish its importance. But what I am saying is that when, when the church became much more inclusive, then one of the things that needed to happen was we needed to give people a little more space for community development so that People weren't thinking, thinking, well, I just go to church to be reverent and, you know, things right. are things are in Latin and I don't really understand everything about what's going on, but I know it's important to be here. But one of the beautiful things about the Second Vatican Council was it invited people more into worship, into participation, into prayer, into singing. And part of that also said, we need to also help people feel welcome here. So let's lighten up a little bit on the, well, you've got to be quiet before mass starts. And once it's over, you got to get out of here and be quiet. It's like, no, because mass, the Eucharist uh, is, uh, it's all about community, community Mm -hmm. worship and building community. And so if I have a nice conversation with a friend of mine who happens to be of a devout Catholic, during, and I don't see them usually, sure. I see them at church, where better to have that conversation? No, and, Bill, you ignore them. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> That's like, exactly what Jesus would have done. And, and you know, the funny thing is, 
the conversations that I start with those people, like right after mass, you know, mm -hmm. uh, like our, our, the parish that we go to at St. Hillary, you know, right after mass, you just hear people just greeting each other and being so happy to see yeah. each other. And many of those conversations start in the church and then they move out into the parking lot. And so instead of just having everybody trying to get out of there and running over each other, like it used to be before, yeah. before the Vatican council, people are visiting and they're, and they're building community and they're talking about, you know, maybe what happened and what, what they sung or what they heard in the homily or whatever. Well, and, as a guy, as a guy who spent four years away from, from church altogether, I can tell you that if it was not for community, I don't know where I would be today. Yeah. I mean, these were, uh, some of them were men that became part of my life who inspired me and mm -hmm. mentored me mm -hmm. to get my act together, so to speak. Sure. And challenge me to to live a life uh, yeah. as a vocation, as a father and a husband, yeah, and certainly as a as a child of God. Mm -hmm. uh, to the friends that we made as couples, that mm. uh, Amy yes. and I began to do things together within a church community that we had never had done before. Yeah. And so, well, sure, those things existed, and you had your bingo, and you had your uh, community events that would exist around the church. Part of the beauty is this integration of, I mean, heck, St. Paul preached until the guy fell out of the window in Acts. I mean, he, yeah. he talked so long, it was midnight, and the guy falls asleep and falls right out of the window. They were just having a party <laughs> yes. talking about Jesus. And, yep. It, yep. It, and so here we are coming together, and we're, you know, in the Catholic Church, we're blessed to have this liturgy where we're bringing and calling together the, the, the Word and, and the Eucharist, but at some point, there also needs to be the understanding that, yeah, we're the body of Christ. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting, Greg, because another outgrowth of the Second Vatican Council was the emphasis on the fact that there are really kind of at least, well, I guess I'd say three aspects to the Eucharist. The Eucharist, you know, when we, we hear the term the sacrifice of the right. Mass, well, that's certainly true because we are commemorating the, 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 you know, God's sacrifice for us on the cross and us receiving that body and blood. But it's, uh, it's sacrament, which is important because it is the source and summit of our faith. But even beyond that, it's also celebration. Mm. So you will hear a lot of people say, well, we're going to celebrate the Mass today. Yeah. And when you think about the fact that that looking at those two of those things, celebration and sacrifice, we don't say it's one or the other. We say it's both. Right. And think about what that means. When you say we're going to celebrate the Mass, celebration implies community. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so that's another reason why I think it's significant that we think about the fact of building community as an important aspect of what that liturgy is all about. Yeah, and that that encourages growth. You know, Pope yeah. Francis said not too long ago that uh, we are supposed to lose the funeral face, yeah. right? Like yes. when people walk into yeah. our church, right? And, and I've heard Methodists, Presbyterians, I've heard other denominations of Christianity outside of the evangelical church and churches mm -hmm. that really do a lot of praise and worship, but... People that talk about there's just such a lack of joy where I worship or where I worship. Yeah, yeah. There is such a it, it just people just seem so standoffish, mm -hmm. right? And sometimes mm -hmm. we mistake reverence for seriousness or or whatever or in, um, yeah. not being inclusive. Yeah. Um, but we have to include other people in the experience, and we have to do it with joy. Yes. That's and right. uh, it is not just a sacrifice. Yes. Um, yes, we are offering ourselves as more of a sacrifice into the celebration than Christ is. He's That's, giving us life, right? Yes, right. So we have, we do have people that don't understand this, and and maybe some places haven't taken the time to help uh, our senior generation understand this part of change yeah. has become necessary. Yeah. It isn't heretical. It isn't something that the church changed and they need to go back to something like it once was before, because that will bring yeah. people back. It's just saying that times have changed. Yes. Media has changed. Influence has changed. That's the right. amount of uh, ways that people are reaching us has all changed. Yeah. 
we as a church don't need to compete with that. We just need to let people know that we're part of that as well. So there's an alternate thing to watch. Yeah. There's an alternate show to watch, an alternate program to listen to, an alternate thing to read rather than worldly things that take us away from being a child of God. Yeah. And you know, Greg, one of the things that we have found out over the years is that, excuse me, <clears throat> people don't go where they're not welcome. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you can extend that to say people don't go where they're not welcomed with a D on the end. So right. what I'm saying with that is I, I've worked in my ministry, I worked for a number of years with people who were in parish work as part of the what was called at that point the right of Christian initiation of mm -hmm. adults. Yeah. And what they would tell me and what I experienced, because I also was on teams that were part of that, you know, welcoming people into the church. And they would I've I found, and then I talked with other people who found the same thing. <clears throat> Many times we would say, what brought you to us to this particular Catholic parish, right? This to place become, right now, yeah. To this, to become Catholic, and you know, they would all they would all talk about things like, well, my spouse is Catholic, or this or that, or you know, somebody I really respect is Catholic. But then they'd always get around to, we chose this church because we felt welcomed here, yeah, home, and we we felt like we would like this to be our faith home, yeah. And so that concept of being welcome and welcomed in is so vitally important and it's but that is even very different right because you always just went to the parish that was closest to you that's right i mean that's, that's right. kind of the old way of yeah, yeah, this the is where you go yeah, yeah you were kind of assigned to a district and um although a lot of people still do base their association geographically which is great but and that's fine that's their choice and we're not here to tell them that's wrong yeah but what we are here to say is i like to say to people if you know, when you come to a new area, my wife and I have, have always done this. When you come to a new area, you might try worshiping at several different parishes mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and see which one you really feel that you might be most welcomed at. And do it not just for the liturgy itself, but maybe find out what, how is this parish involved in justice issues? How is this parish sure. involved in building community? How is this parish, how good of an education do they have in the faith? Do they do adult faith formation? Um, you know, those kinds of things. Yeah. So there's a lot that goes into, again, making your religion and, 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 and then by, by extension, your spirituality, making that a holistic approach because our spirituality and our, that our relationship with God, it's, it's kind of designed around the idea, as I said, of relationship. And with, when relationships are important to us, it grows in us a passion. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. passion then becomes a passion to want to get to know God better. And by virtue of that, and this goes back to the Baltimore Catechism, you know, oh, yeah. to know, to love, and to, to serve, serve yeah. Jesus, to serve God. You yeah. know? Uh, uh, in this world. As I was saying, and, to, and to in the happy, next, to someday and, go to heaven. Next. That's right. So, so you know, uh, when, when we're talking about some of these things from the Second Vatican Council and being lived out today, it, it, it's also rooted in things that were very important before the Second Vatican Council. The Second Vatican Council wasn't so much about uh, putting an end to bad practices. It was just enhancing things more and helping people feel more welcome. And one thing I would say, and... and um this is for anybody listening that, you know, is kind of thinking, well, I've been told this or I've been told that I'm not quite sure which direction to go or what to believe, or I, there's a place that's a little bit further away, but then I don't feel connected to the community. Take it to prayer, like spend the time with God and say, Lord, where do you want me to be? Yeah. And what do you want me to get out of this? Um, yeah. if somebody has maybe become too loose in their faith. They might need a community that is going to bring them back to some of the reverence, right? Sure. If sure. we've become so reverent, we've closed everybody else, then we need to re-program uh, or retrain ourselves a little bit to how do we integrate ourselves into the community? That's true. Or how is our story going to be important to share with somebody else yeah. that God might be leading us into an encounter with? I mean, this whole thing and the way that God works, there might be a point in time where God is just leading you to this community so that you can meet Bill mm. 
and Bill is suffering from something that you've been experiencing in your life and you've overcome, and now the Lord has placed you in that path yeah. to be his Simon, to carry his cross for him. That's the way the Lord works, and we have to respect that and understand that. And so I, I don't know how to say it without it possibly coming off bad, but it's not about just listening to what the church says when it comes to where you worship or how you worship. Mm -hmm. The church is a reflection, a human reflection of what God wants us to be. And sometimes we need to take it to prayer. And when we hear things directly that we feel God is sharing with us or revealing to us in some way, then we have to follow that because we are disciples of the Lord. We're followers of Jesus Christ, not bricks, not human beings. We are followers of Christ. Yeah, yeah. And and I think the more that we begin to build that relationship, the more that we trust in that relationship, then the more that we see the fullness of the places we worship and how we're worshiping, and and there's beauty in that. There are two things there that I think are really... I just want to point to because yeah, it's so ahead. important. The first one is that um, you talked about how sometimes we're being given an opportunity by God to meet somebody who maybe we can help or who can help us. Yeah. And, and often it works both ways. Yeah. <clears throat> one of the greatest examples of that in history is the whole anonymous movement, the Alcoholics Anonymous, mm, the uh, mm-hmm. emotion, uh, Emotions Anonymous. I, for example, um, as I mentioned, I in my spiritual direction work, being a spiritual director, one of the things that I have found very helpful for me is I suffer <clears throat> from uh, a, a, a uh, mental condition really called uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. Okay. Now I take medication for it. I've done counseling for it. I do spiritual direction with a director for it. It's great help to me. But what, what I also know is that because of that, I have found I'm able to read those signs in some of my directees. Mm. Mm-hmm. And when some of my, now I'm not a licensed counselor, but I know, for example, if a person is having a hard time, Uh, understanding God's love for them because they're so hung up on being a bad person because, oh, I did something wrong and how can God ever forgive me, et cetera, et cetera. Part of my great gift, I believe, from God is helping them to understand that God loves them no matter what. And other people have been telling them that for years, Mm -hmm. but perhaps other people just haven't been able to get that point across because they other people have never sat in that same they chair that yeah they, they can't relate the yeah. same way you can you know, so that's a very important aspect and the the other thing which maybe we could talk about on another podcast sometime i don't want to go into <laughs> for it for sure but um i'd love to talk sometime i write i wrote about this in my first book the concept of free will is one of the mm. most fascinating concepts in all of the church and it's one of the most beautiful concepts because free what free will is is God giving us opportunities to meet and respond to other people, but we still have to make the decision of whether or not we're going to do that. So God is not just managing us like puppets on a string, or God is not just throwing us out there and saying, you're on your own for the rest of your life. God is saying, I will give you opportunities, but I will not choose for you. You mm-hmm. must make your own choices. And that's, anyway, that takes a lot more unpacking. We can't do right. that today. But it's, it's a beautiful concept, too, of how much love God has for us that God has given us free will. Yeah, he, he wants to know that, um, God wants to know that we're choosing him. Yes. And, yes. and the way in which we open up ourselves to him, Exactly. I think, really, really proves that. Yeah. And, um, so there are a lot of people that I think struggle with that. And I love the way that you write. Uh, I love the way that you, um, have written both of your books, uh, in your new one, a time of blessings and peace. You know, these are 30 mini retreats to celebrate the retirement years. Mm. And as we talked about that, you know, some people have been, um, maybe a stay at home mom, uh, their entire life. But that, as we know, is a 
an, an amazing career. It is. An amazing and, vocation. And one that they should eventually get some rest from. I mean, yeah, you're right? always going to be the mother or the parent, but hopefully you have a few less responsibilities when you get to be retirement age than you did when you were raising that family because that, <laughs> that could be and, and was for many people more than a full-time job. Yeah, and I think retirement is even changed on the way that people look at it because when I was a kid, I always heard, you know, you thought people retired and they went off on the beach somewhere and they just lived and people brought them pineapple drinks all day yes, long. Yes. Before the podcast, we were talking about when you're retired, you said that you need a bigger calendar because yes. you have more things to do. More things that you are being invited to do. And of course, you have to decide, do I have time for this or not? Or is this something that I'm really passionate about? That passion thing is very important in retirement too, so yeah. that you're doing things that are feeding your own relationship with others and ultimately then your relationship with God. Yeah. Yeah. What, so what made you, when you sat down to write this book, I mean, we, you always have a lot of different things going on in your mind and different ideas. How did you end up settling on focusing on the retired age group mm -hmm. and creating these mini retreats? Great question. And, um, let me answer that with a couple of different points. The first point is this. Uh, I'm now 74 years old. Come on. Yes, I am. Thank you. I, I assume you think... <laughs> Why do you I look, look better than I do? <laughs> well, you, no, I'm not going to go there because I think you look great. But anyway, the point is that I believe that I am uh, qualified to relate to this age group because I sit squarely in the middle of it. I am the so, age group. Yes. So, you know, I am of the age that I can say, you know, I've lived, I've, I've actually been semi-retired now for about 13 years. Mm -hmm. And so I, and it came to me one day that it, it, this actually came to me in part as what I just said a moment ago when I was talking about those who are best equipped to help somebody mm -hmm. are those who've already experienced at least some aspects of what they've experienced. Sure. You know, nobody ever experiences the exact same because we all have unique lives. Yeah, right. But we have things in common. I have things in common, some things with in common with any 74-year-old in this country mm -hmm. because we lived and were born at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so we have a lot of the same environmental experiences. So that's part of what led me to want to gravitate towards this particular topic. Mm -hmm. And then part of it was because of my experiences with retreat work mm -hmm. and spiritual, I've done a lot of study on spirituality. And one of the things, although I, I believe strongly in catechetics, religious education, because I spent my life doing that. But as my wife likes to say, and I quote her all the time on this, she says, we have to remember that religion, whether like religious denominations, et cetera, et cetera, they were, they were created ideally to get us closer to God. Mm. God was not created for religious denominations. Mm. So what that drove me to do was to say, there are a lot of things I've learned in my life that appeal I think, to people who have been grown and raised or come to the Catholic faith, but there are also things in the book yeah. that you will find that are for anybody who is a worshiping Christian. And I even sure. do make an occasional reference to, you know, Buddhism or other forms of uh, development of spirituality, spirituality. If they if they say something that we can take and appropriate, you know, uh, into our faith. Yeah, if you want to, <clears throat> just to not to cut you off, but you know, if you want to learn part of the skills of being present to have a deeper prayer life, and you're struggling when you go to church to pray and you want to be present, the Buddhist monks like. They have, they've Amazing. got the market on presence, right? They know <laughs> about presence. They, they know about presence like almost nobody else. And for example, it's no accident that, uh, uh, that uh, Thomas Merton, the monk Thomas Merton, one of his very best friends was the Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh from Vietnam. Love Thich Nhat Hanh. The two of them had a fabulous, and their greatest, what brought them together was their concepts about solitude and nurturing solitude and how that leads us then to better practice our spirituality. Yeah, I'm and, reading the book. Uh, it's either I am here or you are here. I don't remember the title, but because I'm trying to be present, I don't have to remember those yeah, things. But right, yeah. I'm reading that book right now, and there's one that he has on silence, which is amazing. And uh, yeah. 
Libby, my event coordinator, is just read the one on fear. Um, yeah. You know, yes. so amazing books that yeah. that we can learn and grow from in these yeah. other spiritual development practices that we can appropriate without leaving our own faith exactly. tradition. And I think that's an important thing to remember too, is, uh, you know, if you decide to leave it, well, that's your business. But all, my point is right. we don't have to be mutually exclusive. One of my favorite present day theologians, uh, a priest, a Franciscan priest by the name of Richard Rohr mm -hmm. likes to talk about the concept of both. And right. Richard says, too often in our lives, we think that everything is linear in a way that we have to say, it's either this way or it's that way. Amen. And if you're this way, then you can't be that way. And the two of you probably can't talk to each other real well. Right. Well, we see where that takes us. Exactly. And it takes us nowhere good, both in terms of spirituality, in terms of politics, anywhere you want to go. Unless people are communicating and understanding the importance of the both, excuse me, the both and, yeah. then we miss a lot. And so, so Rohr says we have to look at both and. There's something of value in just about anything that anybody has to say. Sometimes it takes a long time and a lot of effort to uncover it, but you know, it's important to listen and yeah, important I, to respect the other traditions. I, I think that is a, is a huge thing, especially for people that as we age, that it's supposed to be this way. Yeah. And uh, Kurt Troy, who I interviewed a few weeks ago, he was reminding me that there is no way that anything should be. There are morals and values, but just because you desire this outcome doesn't mean that that's the outcome God desired for you mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. that's the way it should be. Mm -hmm. And so I think when we go to a church, nothing should be a certain way. What is certain is that we need to encounter Christ. Mm -hmm. Right. Do we all the yeah. time? No, like I should, but mm -hmm. maybe I'm just really overwhelmed emotionally and my brain psychologically is not allowing me to focus on anything outside of myself. Those things have happened. Sure. I just pray for the grace to be received yeah. and to allow me to be transformed despite my ears not hearing or my mind not comprehending. Yes. Give me the ears, Lord. Give me the eyes. Help me. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And we're, it's all about God wanting to help us to grow in that relationship. And, um, it's so, so, just so important. Yeah. So you, we were focusing on, you know, these retirement years. Mm -hmm. What, where do you begin to even help, uh, whether it's the reader or somebody that you're leading, um, somebody that's just getting into that retirement phase? Mm -hmm. What is it that you begin to help them understand as it would relate to these, this time of blessing and peace? I, usually start almost always, I guess I start both in writing and also in my spiritual direction work. I try to get a sense of whether or not my directee or my reader, you know, yeah. I, I just have to anticipate that there are going to be people in all different places who are going to sure. pick up this book. I want them to first of all, think about what does it feel like to be loved unconditionally? And so sometimes that means asking them to think about, and I even do this in the book, where I ask them to think about who is a person who in your life who loved you no matter what. Mm. And it might have been a parent. It might not have been a parent. It might have been sure. a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle, or it might have been the parish priest, or it might have been a sister who taught you in school or a lay person or whatever. But yeah. who showed you the kind of love where you said, I feel accepted. I feel like I, I could tell this person anything yeah. because although they are not God, they have a gift that God has given them that will help them to help you to feel a little glimpse of what unconditional love is all about. Yeah. So that's, and you know, one of, one of the saddest things, but one of the most important things for people of my age is to help them realize that it's not too late to change the way you think about God. Mm. So that's kind of a significant thing to think about for a minute. And yeah. I'm not saying they need to change. What no. I am saying is if they would like to change the way they think about God, if they've always thought of God as somebody who's kind of oppressive, yeah. or somebody who's expecting things of them that they can't deliver on, 
I want them before we have to celebrate their funeral before the wake. I want them to understand that God loves them so much Mm -hmm. that God is really excited about them at this age and with whatever infirmities they may or may not have, that they are still a child of God and loved perhaps in a way they never even realized. But if they have realized it and if they come to the book with a sense of, yeah, I know God loves me and I feel that, that then just opens them that much more yeah. to some of the other chapters in the book. A little, little less work. And, yeah, it's and, a little less work for them. But but I'm hoping that anybody who starts the book, no matter where they are on that, let's call it the love continuum, yeah. no matter where they are in that continuum of, of the way God they feel God loves them, that they are eventually going to make some progress towards God's towards God's loving arms. Yeah. You know, I don't know how many times I've said to directees or I've said in the book, imagine God putting God's arms around you. Mm. Imagine those arms and welcoming you, and not just after you've done something good, yeah. but after you've done something difficult or maybe even something that you felt was wrong and you feel needs forgiveness. God is about saying, Come to me. Let me hold you. Let me help you feel better about this. And it's going to be about building back the relationship. I'm I'm going to take a beautiful moment and build an interesting parallel. But I think a lot of people can relate to this because you share the same love of dogs that I have. Yes. And one thing about dogs is the unconditional love that a dog has, regardless of the argument that you had with them, how you had to reprimand them or how long you were gone. Yes. All they want to do is love you. (laughs) Yes. That's all they want. It is is so true. If you, if you've lost hope in some of humanity and you're looking for that ultimate (laughs) sign of, Oh, well, these things have happened to me. Tell me where God loved me then. Yeah. I'm sure God maybe sent a dog in your life to that uh, is so true to love you unconditionally because yeah. you know it is it it's this so often I don't care where you've been and I just want you close to me the prodigal son the whole story about that yeah. return to me yeah um, those are powerful things and in you as you were talking you were talking about people helping others experience unconditional love. And Mm -hmm. it makes me think back to the days of the immigrants in the United States and so many stories about Irish Catholic women helping Irish Protestant women get set up and get settled in and welcoming them into the country. But at that time, it was a mortal sin for these Catholic women to enter into these Protestant churches. And they were doing it not because they wanted to dishonor God or right. because they wanted to go against what they believed. They did it because they saw this other person as the image of Christ. That's right. And they didn't want to let them suffer alone. That's absolutely true. And that's so, that's, that's a great and a wonderful example. And that's an example. And, you know, our church even has, in, in, in the church's wisdom, and this is the wisdom of those who have who have uh, over the years helped to mold the church has created that whole concept of uh, the sense of the faithful and the sense of the faithful is all about, you know, the church forming something called the primacy of conscience, Mm -hmm. which says that when you know in your heart that something is good and necessary and, and it has to be, again, we could do a whole podcast on this, but right. it has to be a very significant point where, you, you, you know, the church's teaching is a little, a little bit not quite there yet. Yeah, is it true, you know, good, is, and holy? Yeah, yeah is, it, yeah. is it true, good, and holy? And you give it a perfect example of where sometimes we just need to say, I know in my heart I need to do this. I need to welcome this woman, even though this woman is, or this man, even though I know that they are not Catholic, I need to go into that church and help them in some way. And that's a beautiful way. And, but I, not to cut that off, but I just have to go back to something you said a minute ago about dogs. And that is, I've used this expression and you may, you probably know this expression, but I believe that there is a very significant reason why dog is God spelled backwards. <laughs> and I think that I've that not is, used that one yet. I think that is to me that sums it up in one sentence. I have never felt 
any closer to unconditional love yeah. on this earth than when that dog comes and just looks up in your eyes or like like your dog Penny did to me today when I walked in the door. She said, I'm so excited to see you. I'm going to jump up and I'm going to put my front feet right here on your chest. I, like, I, I you know, love <laughs> no one else more than I love you at this right. moment, at Bill, this despite moment, my owner. And so, yeah, not only is that a sign of love, but that's a sign of 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 the, the importance of being present to somebody. Yeah, the dog right. is like, for, for about two seconds there, there was nobody else in the world that exib, exib, yeah. exib, exhibit, existed. existed. <laughs> That's the word I'm looking for, that existed, except me. Penny is like, I love you. Here's the focus. Yeah, so. no, I, I love it. And, and, and <clears throat> as we're walking into this, you know, we, we start at the basis, or you start at the basis in your book of, here is the unconditional love, here is the beauty that you are always capable to change. Mm -hmm. That uh, regardless of what you feel about where you are theologically, where you are from a personal standpoint, where you are from the way that you outwardly show affection to other people, mm -hmm. that you can take control through the power of prayer, through the help of God, maybe even through psychological healing and counseling. Yes, right. But you have the yeah. ability to take back the pieces of you that you feel you've lost or or never possessed yeah. because of personal experience. And then and then you begin to move in a different relationship with God. Yeah. And you're doing that through some of these mini retreats. Um, what's one that maybe stands out to you uh, more than another that you really love to share? Oh, that's really easy because I shared part of this in my, I shared a chunk of it in my first book and that was the concept of joy. You know, mm. God wants us to be happy. It's, and it's not like God says, I will, I will only, you will, how do I want to say this? God doesn't say, I will only be happy when you are doing exactly what I want you to do, when I want you to do it, and how I want you to do it. And here's the directory yeah, right. on that. No, what God says is, I want you to be happy. Therefore, I have given you certain gifts and I've talents and those gifts and talents, when they are used, and those gifts, they can be any, they don't have to be gifts to be a priest or a sister religious, or they don't have to be gifts to be a lay minister. They could be gifts to be an accountant or a nurse or a, uh, you know, a housewife, a, a loving mother, a, a, a father, whatever. I mean, they could be anything. But, and, and, and a lot of those gifts transcend even a particular career. Like you may have the gift of being really good at talking to people mm. or really good at listening to people. People, which yeah. is another huge gift that we need in our world today. And God says, when you use those gifts, you will know God better. One of my best examples of that, that I dearly love, I have two and I only have time for one today, so we'll do the other one another time. Yeah. But one of them is about Eric Lytle. Now, Eric Lytle was an Olympic gold medal winner in the Olympics in the 1950s. He is the person uh, who was one of the protagonists of the movie from 30 or 40 years ago called Chariots of Fire. Yeah. One day, somebody was interviewing him because he was, he was from Scotland. And so all the people in the British Isles were very excited about him going to the Olympics. They hoped he would mm -hmm. win the gold medal, which he ended up winning a gold medal yeah. at the Olympics. And one of the interviewers said, Eric, why do you run? And Eric, without hesitation said, that's easy. He said, I run because when I run, I feel God's pleasure. Mm. So he was using, he was one of the fastest men alive in the 1600 meters, 1500 meters, you know, what we would call the mile, you know. Okay. And so in the Olympics, it's in meters. So it was whatever that meters is. He was one of the fastest people in the world. And he knew that God had given him the right sinews, the right muscles. He had trained him a certain way. And he also loved running. He loved what it did for his energy. So he put that all together. And he said, so the spiritual aspect of all of this is God has given me these talents and I can use them to give God glory. One of the ways mm. I will do that is to share with people how much, how I realize that when I do this, God loves it because I'm exercising my passion, yeah. my love for life. I feel more alive when I run. Well, and I feel more alive because ultimately I feel closer to God. 
Yeah, it's 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 a vocation to him. Number one, exactly. he can inspire people with his gifts. Yeah. Then he can tell people where that source is. Yeah. And I so often remind uh, people who maybe come to a live event in where I'm encountering them, and they're at that age where they're moved into their late 60s, 70s, even 80s, and they're not so sure what their purpose has been in life. Yes. And I try to help, number one, remind them of the lives they've touched, but number two, the gifts that they still possess. Yes. Oh, so that's maybe you're, so important. Maybe you're a great baker. Maybe you're a sewer. Maybe it's just your ability to call a friend on the phone. I have to tell a story, a real quick story about my mom. My mom came to stay with us uh, the, a couple weeks ago, and she had had an episode uh, where her blood pressure was a little bit out of whack. Mm -hmm. And so she called the doctor and the doctor was so nice to spend time and reassure her that she was going to be okay. And anyway, everything turned out okay. But it was what happened the next day that really took me back. I overheard her make a phone call to the doctor's office. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to know the name of the nurse who helped her because she wanted to personally thank her oh, for the time that she took. That's beautiful. And, I, and she said... You always hear when people aren't happy with service or you get complaints very readily, but I just wanted to call and tell her thank you and what a difference it made because I was scared. Oh, that's beautiful. And I think that that is, but that is part of her gift, right? Like she used, that is glorifying God. So when we talk about that we can change and we can use our talents for God's glory and God's pleasure, as Eric said, like... That is what God wants. Right. Uh, Father Frank Cosum once said to me, he said, I think that when we get to heaven, God will say to us, did you enjoy my creation? Yes. Yes. And, yes. and you know. This, and then he will say, tell me some details. Yeah. Tell me some stories about that. What did you love that? most? Yeah. 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 How did you care for it because you loved it? What, you know, all those different aspects. And so the beauty of it is that. Our life of faith and our relationship with God and our quote unquote religion, if you call it that, is to glorify God in all things that we do. Yes. Yes. For the purpose to know, love, and serve God. Yes. Yes. And if it's baking, bake for a funeral, bake for a neighbor, do whatever you can. That's your gift. Use it. Yes. Right? Yes. And, and you mentioned something else, and, and you even have a, a whole section. Uh, in your book, and we're talking about the book, The Time of Blessings and Peace by Bill Miller. It's actually a time of blessings, I apologize, but um, it's 30 mini retreats to celebrate your retirement years, uh, even if you're just semi-retired or still working a part-time job. Yep. But you have a section in here, Concentrating on Relationship Building. Yeah. And the very first retreat that you listen, uh, or I'm sorry, that you read, is about holy listening. Yes. This gift of listening, you, you started to mention it just a little bit, but I wanted to focus on that a minute because so often uh, I think there are so many people that think to change we have to do mm. or to uh, act as church we have to mm. be in motion. Yeah. And I want to talk about this sense of being yeah. for a moment when we talk about listening. Great. I'd love to. So I'll just start by saying, Again, like I said about the whole thing with God and dog, well, there's another parallel here, and that is there's a reason why we are called, we are called or yeah. addressed as human beings, not human doings, okay? Yeah. And we lose that sense sometimes of the fact that we were created to be. Now, in being the best person we can be, that means doing good things. That means doing, it means a lot of things. But ultimately, we should never lose sight of the fact that we are created to be. And yeah. what are we created to be? We are created to be God's lovers. We are created to be in love with God. And that requires both doing and uh, silence, listening. And so yeah. I want to go into this listening thing for just a minute. When I was being trained as a spiritual director, the first person who came to address us in our training was the author of a book. Uh, her name is Margaret Gunther, I believe. And she is a, an Episcopal minister, I'm pretty sure. And she came, she's a trained spiritual director. Yeah. She was training us. And she 
she wrote a book called Holy Listening, mm. which actually gets quoted. I quote it often. It's probably in at least one of my books too. And what Margaret talked about was the gift of listening. And she mm. talked about how to be a better listener. She talked about why it's important, not just for a spiritual director, but for anybody who wants to build relationships. Mm. And the more, the better we become at being good listeners, the better we become at being good uh, conversationalists, yeah, the better we become g- good communicators, the better we become at being good understanders of other people, the better we become at being able to reclaim our own stories so that we can interject them where appropriate right. into another person's story get by giving examples. And so the concept of listening, not only in our, in our culture, not not in our church, but in our culture, our secular culture, if you will, listening is woefully underappreciated and sure. underrated. And so one of the things she said, the first thing that a good spiritual director needs to know is that a good spiritual director is forced, first and foremost a good listener yeah. because n- the relationship will go nowhere if you are. So if I'm sitting there and, simp- and not even concentrating on what that directee is saying, or if I'm sitting there thinking, how am I going to respond to that point? And maybe you miss the next point that they're saying. No, just take it all in and then rely on the Lord to help you address the points that the Lord will help you dire- address. Yeah. And so, but as I said, she also taught us that as you become a better listener, you, no matter whether you're a spiritual director or not, you become a better communicator, a better relationship builder, mm-hmm. a better, a better human being. Yeah. Being. Yeah. I, I have a confession to make and, uh, I've judged a lot of people. Oh Yeah. Hey, right? I, I don't know. I hate to, yeah, but that doesn't go away. You work on it. You try to get better at it. Yeah. But that's one of my, that's one of but my. But you know issues. what changes me is listening. Yeah. I mean, once I have, uh, I would say that the amount of people that I judge is less now. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I really work to judge no one because I don't want anybody to judge me. But part of the reason that I judge so many people is that I wasn't a listener. Yeah. And as I've gotten to know more stories as I've begun to understand why people are the way that they are and some of the horrific things that have taken place in their life that have led them to where they are today, it has allowed me to be the image of Christ for them in that moment, not only to change them, but to change me. Right. And the change in you has to happen before you can become the image of Christ to them. Exactly. Exactly. And so I think that when we listen we see the whole person, we, we take on compassion in a new way, and then we also pause long enough to let the Holy Spirit work through us so that the Holy Spirit responds That's right. because of what we've heard in the manner that we've heard it, and even if it is something that um, is addressed at us with angst or anger yep. or uh, some sort of judgment even towards us, yep. that we can help diffuse the situation by being the presence of Christ, just as Jesus, during the woman committing adultery, draws in the sand without saying a word, yeah. assessing the situation, yes. knowing her shame, knowing what she needs, and then not judging her for it, not asking her why, That's but right. simply telling her, your sin is forgiven, go away and sin no more. Yes, that's, and if I may, yeah. I want to give, again, you know, I like to tell stories, so yeah. I, have, I have to give a story, again, a story that I came across as I was learning more about spirituality, and it's a story about Fred Rogers, yeah. Mr. Rogers, Love from Mr. Rogers, Rogers' neighborhood, and uh, when Fred was alive and doing his programs, he also did a lot of talks, both mm-hmm. regionally and nationally, and he, he told a story about being at a national event one time. And a woman came up to him after the event and wanted to talk for a minute. And it turned out that she was a social worker. And she said, you know, I really resonated with what you had to say today. And it reminded me of something that I had have experienced. And then she went ahead and told this very short story here. That's just like two sentences. She said, I've come to learn over the years that I don't think there's a person that I couldn't learn to love 
if I really knew their whole story. Mm. Now, when you think about people that we've encountered uh, just in the news or that yeah. you've encountered, encountered in your own life, like you said, I'm the same way. Sometimes I judge a person and I'm like, what the heck is wrong with yeah, them? Right. Boy, they could, I could never be friends with them. I don't even want to spend any time around them. You know? yeah. But when she said that, and he went back to his hotel and he wrote it down. He wrote that down and he put it in his billfold. Mm. And he said, that's one of those, he said to himself, that's one of those things I never want to forget that mm. I've heard. And you know how we all clean our billfolds out, at least? Yeah. I do mine maybe like once every six well, months. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't, do it yeah, I don't even have bills you know, to put in the fold. Yeah, it's just yeah, those notes. Right. You know, but, but occasionally I have to get my credit card out. <laughs> and then even then I might see it. But, you know, it was that idea that I, that is so important. I want to hold on to that. Yeah. And I think that sums up both the importance of listening and also the importance of listening for understanding. Yeah. And the importance of developing a sense of empathy. You know, it's like the, uh, I've so many people I've read, psychologists, psychiatrists, and they say we can't really fully develop our relationship abilities with other people until we, or even with God, until we develop our sense of empathy. Yeah. Can you? Can you? And it's and empathy is different than sympathy. You know, yeah. empathy is like saying. I kind of understand a little bit of what you're feeling now. I don't understand exactly what you're feeling, right. but you know, there was a time when somebody hurt me and I think I understand a little bit of the hurt you must be feeling. Yeah. And that's when we start to develop empathy. Yeah. I, and I think that we, you know, I think that that's a great uh, point to kind of like begin to end with today, because I think about people like even the deepest serial killers and people that have committed crimes Yeah, that yeah. when you know their full childhood and maybe yeah. the abuse that they lived yeah. through and how it altered their living, yeah. um, we do have compassion for them and we do want to hold maybe not the monster that did these things at 45 years old, but we want to hold the little boy version, the eight year old that is yeah. somewhere trapped within that body That's right. yeah. and love them and, and to, to love the person, to hate the sin, but not the sinner. Right. And right? If, exactly. And if we could go back and love them at that moment when what would that it change? injustice was done, before it festered and before that injustice or whatever, or that hurt was, was imprinted on them in such a way that it was going to form the rest of their lives. You know, if there were some way we could go back in time or some way that we could even, you know, obviously the idea would be to, to remove them from that before it happened. But yeah. even there, once it's happened, so oftentimes what happens is when people are hurt, then they feel like that person didn't love me. I must, nobody must love me or God must not love me or God wouldn't have loved me. You know, God wouldn't have let that happen if God loved me. All these different things yeah. that go through their heads. Yeah. And of course, life is much more complicated than that. So yeah. we don't want to go to that. But my point being that it's just really important. That's why I feel there are so many things that happen to us. Uh, we could both tell stories all day about yeah, things that have sure. happened to us that have hurt us. Yeah. And if we had allowed them to happen, if we hadn't looked for the grace from God to help us heal from those things, and sometimes that grace comes through other people helping us heal from those things, then uh, we could have been in exactly the same place that person is today who never got healing yeah. and who developed, maybe it's a sociopathic development maybe yeah. it's uh you know maybe they're uh, maybe it's just know, bitterness yeah, that just lay, bitterness lead to a divorce or incredible anger yeah that has to then express itself in acting out so yeah yeah well you know beautiful insights and bill always shares just such an amazing gift of his spirituality and and a joy that makes you excited uh to want to live uh the methods and the principles and certainly the beauty of christ that he's always willing to share so i love talking with bill and and i guess my final reminder to you uh before i give bill his final thought is that you know we struggle that if we knew somebody's story that we would love everybody if we could learn their whole story and I would also remind you to give yourself the grace to allow yourself to love yourself and you may have done things you may have been places you you may even have 
made a mistake that in your retirement years has changed the way that you look at life or the way that you interact with people, but love yourself. And when you love yourself, you begin to find God's unconditional love at the center of it that he's telling you, I just want you to come to me and I will give you rest. I will wrap my arms around you and I love you unconditionally. And when we do that, we begin to restart the conversation with him that allows us to hear his holy voice and to feel his loving presence no matter where we are. And then we take that and we share it with other people. So um, I just want to remind you that if you enjoyed today's podcast, you can always go to faithandreallife.com and you can find all of the different podcasts we've recorded. We are now in season six, uh, an opportunity for you to go back and to listen to the first five seasons. You can find us on all the different podcasting platforms, as well as the video version of this podcast that is on YouTube. And if you're looking at me now, I'm waving at you. So catch us on the YouTube channel at uh, BTV and we're up there. Just go ahead and search for that. Um, And also, if there's any way that we can serve you or your community with a live presentation, feel free to contact Faith and Real Life Ministries, and we will go ahead and find a way to get to where you live and to share this message as well. But certainly share the podcast and let us know how we can help you grow in your faith journey. And if you want to get Bill's book, uh, Bill, where can they get A Time of Blessings and Peace? Where are they able to buy that at? Okay, there are uh, three fairly easy places. One would be to uh, to contact the publisher, who is 23rd Publications. Just look them up under the, the numbers 23rd Publications or the words 23rd Publications. They are the publisher. Uh, And obviously you want to know the title. Uh, You can also get it from Amazon. uh, And then the third place would be, and I would invite people uh, just to do this. It's it's in the back of my book, but I'm going to just say it to you right now. You can also go go to my website, which is www.findingspiritualdirection.com. That's my website. And you can, I actually have a shop there. Excuse me. You can buy it from, from me directly as well. Uh, if you don't want to buy it from the other two places or it's not as, you know, I, I do give a little discount, but I don't give free shipping like Amazon does because I can't afford to. So I find a lot of people But like you do get the it. author more royalties yeah, if you purchase true. it from him. <laughs> that's so true. I right? always yeah, invite, yeah, yeah. as a fellow author, <laughs> yeah, uh, we appreciate true. that. Yeah. So you can find it there. And the only other thing that I would say, because uh, I just want to resonate with something you said a minute ago, Greg, and that is uh, sometimes we think about um, where, how, how is our relationship with God related to our relationship with ourselves or with other people? And I would just like to reiterate the point that we've made today is that those, that concept of relationship, the best way to look at that is not to separate them out as my relationship with God is separate from, but think about it that that concept of relationship it's it's unified it's yeah. a unified relationship the better consubstantial yes it's consubstantial that's right the better we can love ourselves not in an egotistical way yeah. not like oh i'm better than anybody else but as if to, as if to say i know i'm i know i love myself because i know god loves me mm-hmm. you know it's like that that it, there was a banner 50 years ago that said I must be lovable because God doesn't, and they said it in slang, God don't make junk. Yeah. I must be lovable. God don't make no junk. That's right. The better I can love myself as a creature of God, the better and the easier it is for me to love other people who are also creatures of God. And then that then, you know, it, it multiplies. Then that also gives me ability, the ability to say, and you know, God, you are the source and summit of all of this love stuff. <laughs> you yeah. are God is love. So ultimately, I love you. So love is the answer. You know, <laughs> would you say it in one word or one line, I should say, love is the answer. Yeah. And well, Greg, thank you for this opportunity. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's been a time of blessing and peace for me. And uh, we look forward to seeing you the next time on this podcast and uh, any way that we get to encounter you. And uh, I pray that God will meet you everywhere that you desire him always and make sure that you love others, love yourself. And at the end of the day, you will ultimately be loving the image of Jesus Christ. God bless you. Take care.